And so now we come to, to our second session, uh, Progressive Enlightenment and Scientific Management from, 19, from 1890 to, to 1920. Progressive, you know, there's certain words that, that uh, are, are confusing and, and economics is, is a, a discipline that that's generates confusing words, by the way. Uh, for example, economists have this word rent, and you cannot read economic literature without running across the word rent. And what they, what they are doing, they're using a private language, and communicating in a private language is, is, is confusing at best. How many of you know what the word rent means? You know, in common everyday usage. Well, you thought you did, yeah. How many of you ever rented a car, <laughs> or rented an apartment, or rented, God knows what, a house? Well, we all know what the word rent means, but the economics, the discipline, has a different meaning for the word rent. They have their own peculiar meaning. And when an economist uses the word rent, they mean money or, or something in excess of that required to bring that factor into production. And I'm serious. Uh, if, if one looks at a dictionary of, of economic terms, you'll find something very close to that as the way economists use the word rent. Uh, they also, oh, <laughs> imagine this. How would an economist define love? Well, love is an extreme form of an interdependent utility function. Okay. <laughs> now, can you imagine making a song out of that? Can you imagine putting that in, into a poem? But again, economists are the people who think that, cal many economists are the people who think that the most compelling form of communication is calculus. Uh, and you'll recall that I, may, that I explained early in the first session that I'm not a real economist, even though I studied under some Nobel Prize winners in economics. Uh, I'm actually an economic anthropologist, and so I'm not a real economist. Okay. Um, so another word that causes confusion lately, re relatively recently, is the word progressive. Now, we have all heard about progressives in, in, in the media, but the use of the term <clears throat> progressive today, the way it's used today, is very different from the historical origins of the progressives and the progressive movement. And let me uh, explain one of the, what I see as, uh, as one, dist one two characteristics that make the distinction. One, today's progressives have an impulse for imposed coercive political solutions, which mean larger and more intrusive units of government. The other is a, a discounting of the principles of minimal government that motivated America's founders. The original progressives, meaning those of the 1890s, are the most well-known of whom is Theodore Roosevelt. And Roosevelt and his Bull Moose Progressive Party saw themselves explicitly as anti-socialist, where many of today's progressives feel a sympathy or express a sympathy for socialism, and I've, I've seen survey data on this, and some, it depends on what age bracket you're looking at, but often close to half seem to be at least express uh, support and a preference for, for socialism, where the original progressives were explicitly anti-socialist. Um, Teddy Roosevelt and the Bull Moose progressives made, uh, made this a big point. The second thing about the original progressive movement 
and as Eric sort of nice we're talking about this at, in a Lutheran church, is it was explicitly pro-Christianity, the original progressives. The, uh, the 1912 Republican convention uh, so uh, had uh, was had hymns including "Onward, Christian Soldiers," and T.R. had a famous oratory that he uh, basically described. Well, here's a quote: "We stand at Armageddon, ready to battle for the Lord." Wow. <laughs> That's really quite, quite remarkable. I don't think that could possibly happen uh, in a convention, uh, in a Democrat, certainly not a Democrat convention today. But the progressives at that time were actually evangelical uh, Christians, and that difference is, is really quite remarkable. We cannot confuse those progressives of 1890 to, 19, to the end of World War I with today's progressives. The people who exemplify the progressives, the original ones, Woodrow Wilson, Gifford Pin Woodrow Wilson, Gifford Pinchot, and Margaret Sanger. And their basic theme was the importance of management by experts and management of nearly everything in society by experts. There was, a, there was a huge distrust of democracy. Woodrow Wilson, who had been president of Princeton, uh, was explicitly opposed to democracy and favored an imposition of much more control by experts. Some of the most negative things about the early progressives was their enchantment with the eugenics movement. And this included forced sterilization, uh, the identification of people by mental abilities, of, of, of former, uh, a famous Supreme Court case uh, that held that three generations of imbeciles are quite enough, and so forced sterilization was indeed appropriate and beneficial for the nation. Uh, so there was a, a very, very strong emphasis on control by experts rather than democracy or spontaneous order. But the progressives had a recipe for managing natural resources, and we will talk about that at some length. The U.S. Forest Service, which manages an area equal to Texas plus Louisiana, a big chunk of, a big chunk of country, 192 million acres. And this was explicitly designed to manage the timber and grassland resources owned by the federal government. And Gifford Pinchot was the godfather of this movement. And he believed that management of the forests, and not only the forest owned by the government, but all forests should be subject to the management and the dictates of the US Forest Service or the state counterparts, because many states ha have, like Montana, uh, has a State Department of Forestry. But there's a lot of territory owned, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, owned by the state, managed by State Departments of Forestry, and in nearly all cases, they are mandated to manage that for profit, the, the state forest for profit, almost always for the exclusive benefit of the school systems. And I don't know if that's true. It's not true in every state, but as a rule, of, the default rule is that they're to be managed, the state forest lands are to be managed for profit and for the benefit of the school systems. The Forest Service was a really, really successful experiment for a long, long time, from 1906 
basically uh, until 19, through, through, the, through the 50s, and Newsweek had a feature with Smokey the Bear on the cover where it lauded the Forest Service. What a wonderful organization it is. But what it did when they were lauding it, it put out fires and stamped on bugs and sold timber. And it was almost entirely selective cutting, meaning they didn't come in and just mow down all of the trees in an area, but rather they selected trees to, to harvest. And in the 60s and the 70s, the Forest Service policy of managing their lands changed. And they began doing explicitly what they originally were strongly opposed to, and that was clear cutting. And the Forest Service became an organization that essentially clear cut everything that they cut at all. Now that's not quite true, but, as a, but it's a, a, in the West that basically was the, was the case. And bureaucracies in general end up being managed for the benefit of bureaucrats in them. And again, I've, I think I emphasized last time, but let me repeat it. And that is when I'm critical of the federal agent, land management agencies, mainly the Forest Service and the, and the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's not that there's corruption in them the way it's normally understood. In other words, this, the political co uh, corruption that we associate with places like the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois is ab nearly totally absent from the land management agencies. I cannot think of a single case of any major form of just naked corruption in these federal agencies. That's not the problem at all. And I've made this statement many times in many places and no one has ever said, oh, but wait a minute, you forgot to mention. That's never occurred. Uh, no one's ever, ever corrected me on that. And uh, when I say, when I emphasize the, the, the rule of experts, this was a really, really strongly elitist position. And you recall that the schools of forestry, Yale was the first, and it was even a Harvard forest, Cornell had a forestry school, Michigan, um, but the elite schools had these forestry, had these schools of forestry, and they provided the personnel to provide the expert management. Forestry program, Yale, 1900, Harvard, Cornell, Michigan, Berkeley, University of Montana, 1913. I, I, was, I interviewed at, uh, at Yale a, 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 early in my career. At, uh, at that time, it was a school of forestry. Uh, and it just changed its name now totally. And I, I, it's like it's now the school of like a, ecology and environmental studies or some, something like that. They're sort of be embarrassed about having this, this uh, cut trees for profit orientation. Uh, but regardless, the, these schools turned out really quite well-trained people, set out with a mission uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a missionary sense to manage the, the nation's resources. Um, okay, here's a, the, uh, a, a quote from the June 22nd, 1952 uh, Newsweek. The Forest Service is one Washington agency that doesn't have to worry about next fall's election, nor will the next administration have to worry about the Forest Service. In 47 years, the foresters have been untouched by scandal. As a result, quote, most congressmen would just as soon abuse their own mothers as to be unkind to the Forest Service. And that was Newsweek, June 2nd, 1952. Uh, again, what they were doing at this time was putting out fires, stepping on bugs, and uh, selectively harvesting timber. And not very much timber did they harvest in, in those years. And they were 
highly successful by, by almost any standard. However, when the Forest Service uh, nears its centennial, now th this, is, this is, a, uh, is, is, an, is another quote. As the Forest Service nears its centennial in 2005, its reputation could not be lower. It has suffered scores of scandals. Again, not, the, not stealing stuff. Uh, I mean, scandalous in terms of the management. Um, Forest Service abuse is a favorite sport on Capitol Hill. It's much harder to find friends of the agency, meaning the Forest Service, than enemies. Even the Smokey the Bear is blamed for many forest health problems. And you notice the smoke in the valleys lately? That we thank God this, the rain and snow is, has, has put that, that out. Um, here's a, a, a quote from Randall O'Toole, um, who's a, a, a forest economist, among other things. The West is on fire. This summer alone, some 47,000 wildfires have destroyed 8 million acres at an area the size of Maryland, which is sort of a small state. Um, not only have forest homes and wildlife habitat been destroyed, but air pollution levels have spiked in the West's normally pristine mountain air. And the ugly truth is that over the past several years, the frequency and size of these Western forest fires have been increasing. And then the question is, what caused it? Now, some, are, some people, of course, say climate change uh, has caused it, and it almost surely has had, uh, had an, an effect. But other people are arguing that the primary cause of the fires from the Forest Service are greatly reduced logging and road building. And roads give access, of course, to, to put uh, fires out. It is this management, this man, quoting now, it is this mismanagement practice by the Forest Service can be tied to the increase in disease and insect infected, infected forests, which have become literal tender boxes ready and waiting to be ignited. And uh, uh, going on, the Forest Service, uh, prior to, to, uh, to Bill Clinton becoming president, the Forest Service spent 16% of the annual budget on fires. By 2015, it was over 50%. And since 1990, the claim is that 450 firefighters have lost their lives fighting these wildfires. So this agency, created by the progressives uh, in 1906, enjoyed this very strong reputation, very strong positive reputation, and has just totally flipped. Here's one of the things that, that people, that, I seem to be, that I find sort of hard to understand, and that is the Forest Service, 192 million acres, was given this timber resource. They didn't have to pay, they didn't have to buy the land, they didn't have to pay to plant trees and grow the trees. They're given this huge inventory, and yet they managed to lose money on something like 90% of all timber sales. Wow. I mean, isn't that quite quite remarkable how one could do this. There was a fellow uh, back when I was in an earlier life, when I was buying timberlands and, and logging, I was talking to one of the senior people on what used to be the Gallatin National Forest. Uh, and he explained to me, I was asking, how can, how can it be that the Forest Service loses money on this free inventory? And he says, well, John, I've been in the agency now for, I don't know what he said, 35 years or whatever, a long time. And he said, I'll tell you something. If the Forest Service had been given that, instead of been given all this, this timber, if we'd been given silver and gold to dispose of, given to it, he said, it would only be a few years, a decade at most, before we would lose money on every sale. Now, this from a guy inside the agency. 
Uh, and he wasn't hostile to it. I mean, he, he, he liked the people he was working with. He liked the ideal of, of the national forest. But the bureaucracy had, was, was so, uh, what, what word sh should I use? Was so convoluted, created so many impediments to good management that he, now I'm sure he was exaggerated, they couldn't lose money, you know, giving away or selling gold and silver, uh, but he s said that to, to il illustrate a point. The belief that management of our natural resources could be turned into a science now it seems naive and terribly mis mis misplaced. Um, the experiment that we that we're watching with and enjoying with with the park um, is is evolving in response to totally changing circumstances from what it was when when the park was was created. But it's a, it's experiment that is ongoing, and we saw the modification first from from no management at all, protection just by distance and by ignorance of its existence, then management by the army, and then management by the uh, creation uh, of the Park Service, which in general seems to have done a, a quite, quite a good job. But it is under great, great pressure, and this experiment will, con will in fact continue. Let me give you one uh, Far out example. How, you've heard of, I think I've mentioned the American uh, Prairie Reserve up in uh, northeastern uh, Montana, uh, well, half again the size of, of Yellowstone Park. This too is a, is a huge and hugely ambitious experiment. And they, some of the people involved with the American Prairie Re, Re, uh, Preserve, Reserve, sorry believe that this is a harbinger of the next conservation movement. Well, we've been talking about the first one that created you know, the Forest Service and, and the Park Service. And that this, they some believe, will be the, the next uh, model of what the Park Service set out to be. So the scientific management regime had the classification of, of animals into two types, this yellow squinty eyed, meaning the wolves, which they uh, es essentially exterminated, a last one being killed in what, what year was it? Nin was it 1927, if I remember correctly? Roughly, roughly then. And we had the feeding of the bears with the, the hotel garbage. And of course, what we learned there was the, uh, a fed bear became a dead bear as they lost their fear of humans and started interacting with them. And extinguishing all forest fires within 24 hours, which meant that the tinder just kept building. Uh, I was, many years ago, and, uh, doesn't matter when, roughly 1970, thereabouts. I was logging an area that was just north of the park uh, in the Gallatin National Forest. And the Forest Service uh, guy that was managing the sale told me that, the, uh, that some of the areas in, the, in that part of the forest had 100 tons of dead and down, or standing dead or down and dead timber per acre, a hundred tons per acre. That's just astounding. An acre is the size of a football field. But if you have that much fuel and you have a fire, you are going to have a huge, huge, huge fire. And that, of course, is what happened uh, in 88 when Barbecue Bob uh, was super, Bob Barbie was superintendent uh, of the park of Yellowstone, and he was in the Park Service for, for 42 years. How many of you have seen the, the dam on the Gallatin River? 
Oh my God. Where is it? This is marvelous. I'm not, uh, make sure, let me say it again to make sure I was heard. How many people in this room have seen the dam on the Gallatin River? Is that by the canal where they're taking water out? Gabriel Canal? No, it's the Kleinschmidt Canal. The Kleinschmidt Canal at Mile. Okay, here's the story. Let me here. Let me tell the story. Okay. We. <laughs> where do I start? Uh, I start with the fact that that both my wife and I are, represent many generations in agriculture, and our families both. We're in the Midwest. And agriculture is a, is a mission in almost the religious sense. I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know people who are seriously in agriculture. I don't mean someone who buys a hobby ranch or a hobby farm. I don't know people who grew up in, in agriculture who don't somehow have that as part of their soul. So we, we have this ranch, small by Montana standards. It's measured in hundreds, not thousands of acres. But it has, I bought it in 1970, right when I was out of, out of right when I finished my postdoc. And one of the reasons I bought it was because it's just so I, beautifully situated. And we have a mile and a half or thereabouts of the old Kleinsmith Canal that goes through. And the Kleinsmith Canal was privately built from 1883, 82, 83, until 85. And it was built with one steam excavator, and the rest was mussels and drag slips. And it moved this, this water from milepost now, milepost 70 on the Gallatin River. To it ends up just on the west side, west end of the uh, Montana State Ag School, those fields. And it was privately built, it was privately designed, it is privately owned, it is privately managed by us, we're one of the owners, and we have meetings and we have a board of directors and so forth, and we run this thing. There was no federal money in it at all. It was privately built, privately designed, privately managed. Uh, we hire a ditch rider. What does a ditch rider do? Monitors who can get how much water. My, a ditch rider, OK. Every canal that I know of has what's called a ditch rider road on it, which is an easement through all the properties and a ditch rider who used to ride a horse goes by each of the turnouts for water and measures, reads the gauge to make sure the person who has, is taking that water is not taking more than she or he is permitted to have. And if that person is taking more, that person is warned, A, hey, Bill, you're taking more water than you're due. And Bill says, oh, I'm sorry. And then at night he comes and turns, opens, <laughs> opens the head gate again, and the ditch rider sees it again, because the guy at the end now is not getting, or somewhere down, is not getting the water that he owns, that he has rights to. And so the ditch rider will put a chain on the head gate, on the, the crank, such that it can't be opened again. So it's, it's, it's enforced uh, in that way. And the system works really, really well. However, uh, not all the land that could, in terms of hydrology, be irrigated was being irrigated. And the claim of the progressives was, well, the private sector doesn't work well, and so what we need is for the public to fund dams so we can get water to places where the capital markets are not sufficiently active 
to generate the funds required to build the dams and the distribution canals to irrigate land that could be productive. The Congress created the Bureau of Reclamation in 1902, and it had to do a bunch of engineering and come up with a series of projects to build dams and distribution systems to get water to land that was basically not as productive as it could be if it had irrigation water. On our place, just as an example, our unirrigated crop out hayland generates about a ton and a quarter to a ton and a half of hay per year. Our irrigated land produces five to six tons per acre. That is a huge difference. So the Bureau of Reclamation was created to solve a market failure, a failure of the market to adequately generate the capital required to put water where it could productively raise crops. Now, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> there are 11 states, 11 Western states where the Bureau of Reclamation operates. Uh, where were the first dam sites reclamation projects located? I'm told there was one perfect dam and water development site in each congressional district in the 11 states. Is that an accident? <laughs> of course not. Once you give the, once under this great progressive era uh, vision of managing efficiently and effectively, we have given the government the opportunity to take money from unknowing taxpayers, I mean unknowing, not, what, not knowing what it's going to be used for, and use it to build dams to benefit the recipients of water that's given to them at an extremely low price, extremely low price. And very few, and I don't have the numbers on this, a guy, uh, economists have worked on it, I have, haven't looked at this recently at all, but an economist by the name of Del, B. Delworth Gardner from the Star Valley of, uh, of Wyoming, who was, uh, lived in Utah most of his life, and, relatively recently retired from the economics department at BYU. Um, he claims, and his, his water book documents, that a very, very small proportion of the loans made to build these projects are ever repaid. And the reason, of course, is that all of the terms are set by congressional committees. And who, is on, who are on the congressional committees? Well, the representatives from the districts that have or want to have these irrigation projects. And they basically jiggle the rules such that the interest rate is artificially low to begin with. The repayment period, which made sense when they did the initial politically, when they did the original cost-benefit analysis, those, that date is keeps extended until it's out into a basically infinity. And so the money doesn't get paid back. Now contrast that with the situation in the little Kleinsmith Canal that was privately designed and privately funded and privately built and is privately managed and privately monitored today. Now is it a perfect system? Well, not really. Of course it's not a perfect system, but people, the, the people with an interest in it, the people who are the beneficiaries, the people who own rights to that canal, they have very, very strong incentives to pay attention to it. And the dam that I mentioned on mile 70 on the Gallatin River between Gallatin Gateway and the Big Sky uh, Turnoff, it's on the east side of the road, that dam is perhaps slightly higher than this table is off the floor. And it was put in to simply divert some water. And the amount, is, the amount is determined by the state. We can't just take the whole river, by the way. The amount that we can take has to leave water for the fish, of course, and other recreation and other, other, other purposes uh, to which the water is, is put. So we can't just take it all. We can, we can only take a certain amount. And at flood stage, we can as much, have as much as the canal will carry. Um, but 
we are responsible for that dam. And it, so the, do you know how this works? I'm sorry. So the river's coming down. Okay. And there's a, a little diversion dam that's across from the east side of the river to the west side. And then water goes into the entrance to the canal. And then there are head gates. There are four, I don't remember how many, four, roughly four to six head gates that are screwed up or down, and that allows a certain amount of water to go into the canal, and the rest goes across an apron and back into the river. So a certain amount is, is diverted from the river and goes a few feet, not as far as from here to the fireplace in the back, and then uh, goes out an apron back into the river. That's just a, a good way to manage and control it. Designed in 1882, for God's sakes. Isn't that neat? Well, the apron wore out. It's an old apron. I don't know when that apron was built. I just don't know. Uh, but it wore out from freezing and thawing and, you know, just all this erosion from the water. And so we had to fix the bloody thing. And so I was there, what, I don't know, 10 days ago or something like that. I'm one of the owners of the canal. Uh, there are 23 of us, or 20 to 25 owners. And I was there, and who was there? Well, our ditch rider was there. One of the other uh, member of the board uh, uh, who also had an excavator. And so his excavator was there, trucked in with you know, his truck and, and low boy. One uh, hired guy uh, and another uh, one of our canal operators that was running a, a survey instrument to make sure that we got everything right. And they're laying in and forming up to pour a new apron. Amazing that, that all this was going on. And was it, is it correct that none of you who drove up and down the river, or I'm sorry, up 191 to, to get to Big Sky or get to the, the park, had ever seen that dam? No. No one had ever seen it. No, I know. I know what you're talking about. Now you say, oh, yeah, I sort of remember that. But it is so unobtrusive. Yeah. I've talked to fly fishermen who are crazed fly fishermen. These, I mean, talk about a religion. How many of you know a crazed fly fisherman? <laughs> Everybody in this room probably knows a crazed fly fisherman. These are guys who have fished, and women, but mainly guys, who have fished the Gallatin for 30, 40 years. And I, talk, I ask about the... They say, oh, where does, your, where, does your, where does your canal water, where's your water from? I say, it's from the Gallatin. I say, from the Gallatin? How do you get it? I say, well, you know, the dam there on milepost 70. To take, there's no dam on the Gallatin. I say, I promise you there's a dam on the Gallatin. I own part of it. And they say, no, there's no, at any rate, the point is it's so unobtrusive. It is so modest and so mild. I've taken a canoe over it. Uh, it's that, it's that, now I broke the canoe, uh, but still, it's that modest a dam that, that uh, it's unobtrusive, the environmental impact is, and contrast that with the stuff you'll read about if you do, and I encourage you to do so, in Cadillac Desert. It's just really remarkable. When you can use the coercive power to, to, of, of the government to activate this progressive era ideology and scientific management is, it's, there's an ideology behind it. You can do an immense amount of mischief. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> it's not all bad by any means. I mean, the Park Service, creation of the Park Service was almost surely a, a good thing to do. Uh, but it is not perfect and it's evolving. What to do about, about fires? Uh, gosh, uh, Barbecue Bob, remember our story about him and the result of, of having this every fire out within 24 hours, uh, that basically allowed the park to develop an immense amount of fuel. And so when, we, when the fire got going, and it, apparently there were five separate fires that converged in that 88 remarkable, and 42% of the park burned. Uh, just amazing. Uh, 
what happens when you have that much fuel. And so Bob, Bob Barbie, uh, who got the, the nickname Barbecue Bob because he basically defended the fire. He said, look, this place needs to burn. Now, it's too bad it's so big because this was an exceedingly dry year, 88. Uh, I was told that some of the standing live trees had a moist, I don't know if this is true, but it was true, I was told by people who were supposed to know, that some of the standing live trees had a lower moisture content than kiln drying the lumber that you buy at the lumber yard. And so Ramon and I were in, we were observing the fire. How many of you saw the fires of 88? Remember it moving and sometimes it would approach and all of a sudden a tree would just sort of explode? It would just ignite like, you know, like a fireworks display almost. Uh, they, they were so dry uh, that when, when all the conditions were right, were wrong, I mean, it would just almost explode. It was just astounding. By the way, the overwhelming majority of fires are, not, are caused by nature. And I don't know if that is 85% or 95%, but the vast majority of them are caused by lightning. And I remember when I was, uh, well, gosh, when I was growing up, there were these posters uh, with Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent a forest fire. And I assume by that it means by praying that there won't be any lightning, uh, since, since most of them are caused by lightning. Uh, so we're going to have fires, they're mostly naturally caused, and letting them sort of go uh, seems to make a great deal of sense. But then you brought up another problem. You said except to protect watersheds, which for sure makes sense uh, at some scale, like the Bozeman watershed, for goodness sakes. But what about houses that are increasingly uh, creeping toward the forests, and if people are building among the trees, do we have a responsibility to risk humans and spend huge resources to protect you know, $600,000 houses that were built in places that are inherently dangerous? Uh, like, do we have an obligation to rebuild these houses built on seacoast that on a probabilistic basis are going to be inundated by hurricanes or something, you know, every X years, X being a small double digit number. In some cases, there's some of these houses, half a million dollar houses that have been, the location has been rebuilt five and six times. This is nuts. I mean, this just strikes me as just, it's a silly thing. And it's analogous, I think. In some ways, it's analogous to protecting houses that are built where they're in imminent danger. What do bureaucracies want to do? Bureaucracies want to maximize the discretionary budget. Over the secular trend, every, every bureaucracy is, we should expect, every bureaucracy to be run primarily for the benefit of the bureaucrats running it. And uh, until, and I don't know the exact year, uh, but I used to characterize back when I was teaching forestry, the Forest Service is best understood as the world's largest socialized road building company. The Forest Service loved to build roads because Congress would always appropriate money for roads usually more than the agency asked for. Because the districts, the congressional districts, love to have all this economic activity of building roads in the forest, and the forest, would, forest service would defend the road building in terms of, well, timber production, safety, stamping on bugs, and doing all these things. And they had a formula that for every one square mile of of forest, there should be four miles of road. That was their ideal. Now, I don't know if they ever achieved that. Uh, I just don't know. But that was what they moved, were moving toward. Uh, they loved to build roads. The Forest Service is the world's largest socialized road building company. Actually, at one time, I even had numbers on that. 
it was exceedingly rare to see people in schools of forestry criticize the Forest Service. Why would that be? Ah, we have the right answer back there, of course. It's, oh, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And it turns out that, I mean, I, I was tenured in the School of Forestry. Um, and it turns out that the vast majority of money that came to faculty, not faculty salaries, that was part of the university budget, but money for research, money for graduate students, money for postdocs, money to, to go to conventions uh, and, and give papers and all that, the vast majority of that came from the Forest Service. Our area is basically roughly 70 to 80 percent lodgepole pine. Now we have dug fir as well in certain sites. We have, we have some spruce and some of the uh, more moist sites. Uh, but of the conifers, roughly 70 to 80 percent in this area is lodgepole pine. Lodgepole is a fire dependent species and it grows up really, really tight and it protects if you, have a, if you have a dense enough stand and a big wind comes through, that basically there, there is safety in numbers. Uh, and when you, because there have been a bunch of experiments with select, I'm sorry, with, yeah, with selectively cutting lodgepole, and it turns out that you take out, you know, the nice big ones, and then the next time you have a big windstorm, a bunch of the rest of them just fall over. And that's a real mess. When I was a student, um, I was driving around this part of the world uh, interviewing and living on Hutterite colonies. That was my PhD thesis was on the economics of the Hutterites. And one of the places that I stumbled across was Lincoln, Montana, driving on uh, Route 200 between Great Falls and Missoula. And at that time, uh, Lincoln was a very small town. There didn't get a paved road until sometime in the uh, early to mid 1960s and I was there in 67 or 68 the first time and I went into Garland Town and Country there and uh, there was a and I don't know why I stopped in there but it was there weren't many places to stop so I stopped in there and they sold dry goods uh, and they sold hunting stuff and they sold right way stoves and McCulloch and home light chainsaws and snowmobiles uh, and the guy who owned it was a great lion hunter and his name was Cecil Garland and I was and I was talking with his wife Barbara and she, and, I, and I don't remember what we were even talking about but she said, you absolutely have to come back and talk to my husband, Cecil. Because he, there was something about conservation. And because he really uh, is interested in this and I'm sure he can tell you stuff that you would find valuable and interesting and fun. So it was easy to stop back and I did and it turned out that Cecil Garland and the lion hunter and the guy that sold chainsaws and snowmobiles uh, was also the leader of the Lincoln Backcountry Preservation Association. And this would have been 1968-69. And it turns out the Lincoln Backcountry is two, roughly two, uh, 242,000 if I remember right, doesn't matter. Roughly a quarter of a million acres. So it was a big chunk of country it was contiguous with the Bob Marshall. And it was really, really crappy timberland. It just wasn't good for timber. But the Forest Service had these plans to road and log the Lincoln. Why? Well, the timber didn't make any sense. I mean, it was, it was not good timberland. It just wasn't. And that, but the Forest Service very much wanted, they pushed it really hard for a long time. And the, uh, at that time, the super, it was in the, the Lincoln District of the Helena National Forest, and Vern Hamry was the superintendent of the, uh, 
uh, of the Helena. And Cecil was fighting him and organized a group of locals to oppose this sale. And they solicited the interest, if not the support, of Dick Behan, who was a professor, assistant professor, associate maybe, of forestry at the University of Montana. And this fight went on for years and years and years. And the Lincoln Backcountry uh, Preservation Group, they kept coming up with information that, that made it ever less attractive to log the Lincoln Backcountry. And the Forest Service would then jiggle, restudy, and jiggle the numbers to demonstrate that it made sense to do it, like increasing the recreation value and assuming a larger number of hunters would now be there on the roads. And this had an economic impact for, for, and, tour, tour, and all this stuff. And eventually, somehow, I don't know how it happened, uh, but Cecil, who was this charismatic guy, I mean, his wife was really right about that. Uh, he was spellbinding. And he got the attention of a congressman from Mississippi who was head of the appropriate committee in, in Congress. And Cecil, Jimmy something or other, doesn't matter what his name was. Uh, Cecil basically seduced this guy, this guy from Mississippi, this congressman from Mississippi into believing that the Lincoln was this marvelous place that deserves saving. And eventually, eventually, the Forest Service just gave up. And the Lincoln backcountry became the Lincoln scapegoat wilderness, which was, which was then I somehow incorporated the management regime of the Bob Marshall. But that's the way, that these are dynamic systems, and people you know, will invest a ton of energy. Cecil was doing this for I don't know how many years, a long, 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 long time, meaning 10 years at least. Per perfectly, pri all private, his own time, his own money to fly to meet with the congressman from Mississippi. How this stuff happens is just quite amazing, but these systems evolve. By the way, this is just so amazing. I mean, you know, I've been talking about how attractive our place is. I mean, our greater Yellowstone and the area around Bozeman in particular. This is a magic place. I mean, it absolutely is. And we are going to suffer exactly the same problem that Yellowstone is suffering from too many people, too many people wanting to, to, to come here. Uh, I w was it three years ago that there was a bear in Bozeman High School? Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that not astounding? And it didn't, and it didn't eat it. Oh, here, hey, I'm going to leave you with a mystery, okay? If anyone can answer that, uh, I will be delighted. And by the way, this, there, if, there's any, if there are any hands up, we have a, a very few minutes left. Um, why is it the case that we absolutely positively know that bears kill and eat people, and people love bears, and yet... Apparently, there are very few, if any, documented cases of wolves killing people in America, and there's so much opposition to wolves. Mm -hmm. Now, that I just find that an interesting question. Wolves and eat cattle, and they eat sheep. And Ramon and I, we used to run half a half a band of sheep in an area where we had a lot of predation, and we came up with a poster. Uh, when they were talking about, just beginning to talk about bringing wolves back, and our poster was Yellowstone Homecoming, and it shows pictures uh, of wolves, and we caught, and I wrote about it a fair amount, and we caught a ration of, 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 of heat from our ranching colleagues, our, our former friends, but also from the, many of the environmentalists. Because we said, and I explicitly wrote, look, the Yellowstone is not working as it should because there's no big predator there. We need to reintroduce the wolves, but the wolves cannot read the park boundary signs and wouldn't respect them if they could. They will stray out of there. They will, in fact, kill cattle and sheep and ranchers and pet owners, 
uh, they also kill uh, pets, should be allowed to kill them. And oh my God, so we now had both sides really strongly opposed to us. The ranchers, because we advocated the return of the wolves, some of the radical greens, because we advocated killing the wolves when they got in trouble. But I want to thank you all for joining us. And it's just so much fun to be here. <laughs>